So, today we will start on normalization theory. So, the essentially the main question that we will try to answer is how to design a good database. Now, there can be different meanings of what a good database is and the answer can be given informally or formally. So, informally we can say the database is good when each relation or schema represents a particular entity. For example, student is one kind of entity, so there is a relation for st student. Faculty member is another kind of entity, so there is another uh, entity for faculty member, there is a relation for course, etc., etc. Then we can also say that there are no spurious tuple, that means there is no tuple which has got values that does not mean anything. So, there is very little or almost no redundancy. Then we can say that the null values as far as possible are minimized in the entire database schema. So, null values actually represent missing or unknown values and it does not make sense. So, 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 the lesser number of null values it is the better it is. And then there should not be any modification anomalies. So, so this is one important part of it. So, this is, so we will go over this uh, in a little bit more detail the modification anomaly, but this is the informal way of answering what it is. So, what we will do is we will try to tackle this modification anomaly part first. So, this is modification anomaly and let me explain what it means. So, for example, let us just start with a particular schema. Let us say the schema is employee ID, then there is an employee name, then there is a project ID and a project name. So, essentially the idea of this schema is that there is an employee with a particular name who works in a particular project ID with the name of project name. Now, is this a good uh, schema for an employee and project? It is not because of the following reasons. So, the first is the update anomaly. So, what happens is suppose the project name of a particular project is changed. That means every employee ID, so this is a tuple set. Right? So, every employee ID which works in the project will go and change its corresponding project name attribute, which is a lot of changes. So, although only one piece of information the project name is changed, there are lots of changes in the database. This is not a good way of doing it. Then the next one is the insertion anomaly. So, the first one was update anomaly, this one is an insertion anomaly. So, now as soon as an employee is inserted into the relation, the employee must have a corresponding project, otherwise this column becomes null. And as we said, nulls are not really preferred. The other way around is also true, whenever a project is uh, introduced, it must have some corresponding employees, otherwise this column becomes null. And now, it may not be that whenever a uh, project is open, there are employees already assigned or it may not be that when an employee comes to an organization, he or she is already assigned to some project. So, these are some insertion anomalies that will happen. And then of course, there is the third one which is a deletion anomaly. Now, suppose a particular project is being tried to be deleted. Now, as soon as a project is deleted, this for the, the, the employees which were in that project, these two corresponding uh, fields become null and it may happen that the deletion algorithm will try to get rid of this particular tuple. So, the, even the employee ID and employee name may be deleted. So, th so, these are the problems with the modification anomaly. Then the next kind of thing that we will handle is the decomposition. When a schema is decomposed or when a relation is decomposed, what are the issues that one can face. So, whenever there is decomposition, the important property in the decomposition is something called the losslessness. So, I will explain what is this with an example. Suppose here is one particular schema. So, what does this mean? Is that there is a particular uh, employee with a ID, suppose ID 1 whose name is A and who was born in let us say 81 and then there is another person ID with two with the same name apparently and who was born in year uh, 83. Now, what may happen is that the name clash. So, now suppose we decompose this uh, relation into two relations which is ID name 
and name year of birth. So, what will happen is that when we decompose this is what the decomposition will say. Note that up to this point it seems that this decomposition is correct because the informations are all correct. So, 1 A is actually an employee, so is 2 A and for the employee A whose name is A, there is a year of birth 81 as well as a year of birth 83. But the problem is the decomposition must satisfy that when they are joined they should give back the original table. However, the joint produces wrong information in this case. So, the joint produces the following thing. This is again ID name and YOB, but it produces even if you do a natural join, I am assuming a natural join with name. So, it produces 1 A 81, it also produces 1 A 83, it similarly produces 2 A 81 and 2 A 83. Now, you can see that there are two spurious tuples. These are spurious tuples 1 A 83 and 2 A 81. These are spurious tuples. These have resulted because the decomposition into these two tables was not done correctly and so the join is not correct. So, this decomposition is a lossy decomposition because this decomposition loses certain information. So, it essentially violates this very important property of losslessness. So, we would want the database to be such that the decompositions are lossless. So, these two things are called spurious tuples. So, we must strive for a design there where there are no spurious tuples. This, this is important, this is called spurious tuples. So, the normalization theory is actually tries to say how to design a good database in a formal manner. So, it tries to handle these problems of modification anomaly, the lossless uh, decomposition, etcetera. For that, before we go into the normalization theory, we require the concept of something called functional dependencies. So, we will define functional dependencies so that will be used in the, all the definitions of normalization or we will sometimes use the abbreviation FD. So, a functional dependency are constraints that can be derived from the relation itself. So, we say x functionally determines y. By the way, x and y are sets of attributes in a particular relation. x functionally determines y. This is the notation. Value of x uniquely determines the value of y. And you can see where the definition is coming from. This is essentially x is. So, suppose x is the candidate key or the super key of the relation. Then, the unique value of x determines the entire tuple. So, y can be any other attribute. So, here is what it means. Once more, the functional decomposition is that if we say x functionally determines y, that means if you know the value of x, the value of y is fixed and it is an unique value. So, again, the other formal way of saying is that if for two tuples t 1 dot x is equal to t 2 dot x because this the x value uniquely determines this implies that the y value of t 1 should be equal to the y value of t 2. Note that is of course, not the other way around. An example in a student database may be roll number. So, it functionally determines the name. So, if one knows the roll number of a student, the name is uniquely determined. That is the point. And a functional FD is called trivial, it is called trivial if y is a subset of x. Because if x is the unique name, of course, y is unique, it is a subset. So, this is called a trivial functional dependency, this is an important part. Okay. And as we said, a candidate key functionally determines every other attribute of the relation. So, it is the Thing. So, the functional dependencies and the keys, they together define what are called normal forms of the database. So, these normal forms are what we will be going over in more detail next. So, these are normal forms. So, these functional dependencies and the keys depend the functional things. So, before that, we go over certain axioms about the functional dependencies. These are called Armstrong's axioms. So, note that these are axioms. So, this cannot be proved, etc. These are called sometimes called Armstrong's axioms or Armstrong's inference rules. And there are three such uh, axioms. The first one is a reflexive. 
it essentially says that the definition of the trivial thing, if y is a subset of x, then x functionally determines y. The next one is called augmentation. So, if x functionally determines y, then x z functionally determines y z. So, essentially x is augmented with another set of attributes z. If the left side is augmented, then the right side can be augmented and this is not very difficult to understand why. And the third one is called transitive. So, if x if x determines y and y determines z, then x determines z. Again, this is not very hard to understand. Uh, if you know the value of x, the value of y is unique and if you know that unique value of y, again the value of z is unique. So, you can simply say that knowing x will determine the unique value of z. Now, these rules are sound and complete in the sense that any other rule that can be derived from it will also hold and complete meaning no other rule can be outside this. So, every other rule can be derived from all of this from one or more applications of each one or more of this. All right. Now, there are some other rules which are useful, but are not actually per se needed because they can be inferred from the above three rules, but nevertheless they are very useful. First one is called the decomposition. So, if x determines y z, by the way y z means it is a attribute set which is formed of y and z. Then x determines y and x determines z. So, if x determines the values of y and z both, then of course x determines y and of course x determines z individually. Fifth one is called union, which is if x determines y and x determines z, then x determines y z. Again, this is uh, easier to understand. Knowing x, if one knows the unique value of y and knowing x, if one knows the unique value of z, then knowing x, one knows the unique value of the combination of y and z. It is essentially combination meaning it is just a concatenation of the attributes. And the last one is pseudo transitivity. So, pseudo transitivity. If x determines y and w y determines z, then one can say w x determines z as well. Again, it is not very hard to determine because y, there is a unique value of y for each unique value of x and so if y is replaced by x, the same uh, functional dependency goes through. So, that is the idea about the functional dependency and their rules x, the Armstrong's axioms, etcetera. Then using this one can define a closure of a set of functional dependencies. So, if f is a set of functional dependencies, the f plus is called the closure of it. So, given f, all the functional dependency rules that can be derived from f forms f plus. So, f plus is the closure of it. So, similarly, closure of a set of attributes of x with respect to this. So, this is a functional dependencies and these are attributes. If x is uh, the set of attributes with respect to f, then the set x plus is a closure. If x is the set of attributes that is derived from f, then x plus is the set of attributes that is derived from the closure of f, which is f plus. So, again this determines this. Then there is another definition which is called covers. So, f covers g. So, a set of functional dependencies f covers a set of functional dependencies g. If everything in g can be inferred from f. So, which essentially means g plus is a subset of f plus. So, if everything in g can be inferred from f. So, what is the everything that can be inferred from f which is f plus and then g is of course, part of g plus. So, if g is part of f plus as well. So, g can be determined from this and f and g are equivalent. f and g are equivalent 
if the closure of them are the same. So that means knowing f is same as knowing g because the closure, so all the uh, functional dependencies that can be derived from f is the same as all the functional dependencies derived from g and is exactly the same, it is not a subset etc. So knowing f is essentially knowing g, so they are equivalent. It can be also said that f and g are equivalent if f covers g and g covers f. Using this, there is a definition called f is minimal, this is called f is minimal, so there is a minimal set of things. If this is the definition is that every, so every fd in f has only a single attribute in this thing. So, so for f which is a fd in f, the RHS of uh, f, so the right hand side of f consists of a single attribute, is a single attribute. So that is a very important uh, condition, this is minimal because we do not have unnecessary things in the right side. Then any g which is a proper subset of f is not equivalent to f, that is why this is I mean it must minimal meaning you cannot get rid of some functional dependency and get back the same thing, this is f. And the last one is any f minus x union where y is a proper subset of x is not equivalent to f. So what does the third rule mean? So this is 1, 2, 3. The third rule means that let us consider f and let us take out one functional dependency of the form x determines a. Now let us take that out and add another rule which is y determines a where y is a subset of x. So essentially x is being that this rule x uh, determines a is being reduced to y determines a. Then it is not equivalent any further. So the left sides are also in some sense minimal. So because reducing something from the left side of a rule is does not produce the same set of functional dependencies. So this is the definition of when a set of uh, functional dependencies is called minimal. By the way, just remember that this is a set of functional dependencies, not of course a single functional dependency. Now using all of this, so we can define the normal forms and just one uh, important thing is that every set of functional dependencies has at least one minimal set of functional dependencies. So next we will go over something called the normal forms.